Okay, it's my greeting, uh, pleasure here to welcome everybody on behalf of the Enoch Seminar. My name is Isaac Oliver. I serve on the board of directors of the Enoch Seminar. We are here to uh, celebrate the work of Dr. Rebecca Scharbach Wallingberg, her new book, The Closed Book, How the Rabbis Taught the Jews Not to Read the Bible, published last year by Princeton University Press. Uh, this is part, this panel is part of a new and exciting segment of the Enoch Seminar called Meet the Author series. It was launched this year, earlier in June. If you've missed previous sessions, you can watch them on the Enoch Seminar YouTube channel. Uh, for more information, visit enochseminar.org. I'm also pleased to announce that the Enoch Seminar is participating here with Talmud for Everyone to promote this event. Talmud for Everyone is a nonprofit organization registered with the state of Illinois. It's been running since the year uh, 2016. Its goal is to promote and facilitate the study of the Talmud for people of all genders and cultural backgrounds. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit TalmudForEveryone.com. The purpose of Meet the Author series is to draw attention to the publications of scholars by discussing a question or topic raised by their work. Today, we're going to discuss Dr. Wallingberg's work. She is Associate Professor of Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan, where she also teaches about the diverse ways the Hebrew Bible has been imagined and used by religious practitioners since its canonization. We're also graced by the presence of distinguished panelists who have kindly accepted the invitation to share their thoughts on Dr. Wallingberg's book as it relates to the question of how the rabbis of late antiquity related, or maybe didn't relate, to the Hebrew Bible as a written and authoritative text. These beautiful people are Marjorie Lehman, professor of Talmud and rabbinics at the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. Laura Lieber, professor of trans-regional history of religions at the University of Regensburg in Germany. Daniel Weiss, professor of Jewish studies and philosophy of religion at the University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. And hopefully later on, we'll also have Michal Bar Asher Segal joining us from uh, Israel. She is professor of rabbinic Judaism at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. We're going to proceed here uh, as follows. For th those who are watching us and as a reminder to our panelists, first, I'm going to begin the conversation by asking a few questions to uh, Professor Wallingberg about her new work. Then our panelists will have approximately 15 minutes each to share their views about the topic at hand. And then finally, we'll open the floor for discussion during the last half hour of this session. Before we start, I should also uh, mention that we would not be able to host this event without the presence and support of Joshua Scott, who is running this webinar, as well as many of the other uh, webinars and online events and on-site events uh, for the Enoch seminar. Um, Professor Wallenberg, congratulations on your book. One scholar that I reached out as a potential panelist who cannot join us, unfortunately, because of competing interests, told me in written communication, this is one of the most significant works in recent thought time on rabbinic thought. Um, in the introduction to your book, as well as the first chapter, what caught my attention is your critique of the, the following dichotomy. On the one hand, we have the rabbis of late antiquity, and perhaps this is true all the way until the modern period. Uh, this notion that these rabbis subscribe to the notion that the written Torah, not least the Pentateuch, contained a fixed text that was revealed, even dictated by God, a transcription, as it were, of the divine Ipsissima Verba inscribed on biblical scrolls. Then came the modern era with its higher critics, historical criticism, who deconstructed these traditional claims, asserting that the biblical texts were actually pluriform, produced by multiple authors across time and space. 
You question this dichotomy, however, by claiming that many late antique rabbinic authorities describe the Hebrew Bible as, quote, a contingent and historical document, a fractured echo of divine revelation rather than a pristine transcription of the divine will. And quote, I'm reading here from page 26 of your book. Uh, for our audience, could you elaborate on this point and maybe illustrate it with a rabbinic passage that you discuss in your work? Sure. Although, with your permission, I actually wanted to begin by reading you a Christian tradition that appears to have been rebased by rabbinic authors, because it's the most condensed and straightforward version of the narrative I want to share. The rabbis were always um, weren't always very linear. So. Irenaeus is remembered as saying, during the captivity of the Israelite people under Nebuchadnezzar, the scriptures were corrupted or destroyed by corruption. But when 70 years later, the Jews had returned to their own land in the times of Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, Ezra, the priest of the tribe of Levi, was inspired to order in his mind all of the words of the former prophets and reestablish the Mosaic le legislation for the people. So in other words, folks like Irenaeus actually maintained that the original transcript of the Sinaitic revelation had been irretrievably corrupted or by the ravages of history, let's say. So in their view, the challenge of textual degradation though wasn't actually insurmountable. He wasn't mourning, he wasn't criticizing. He says that an inspired scribe could do a great deal to restore corrupted prophecies to their former glory. So the resulting text would never be the original text, that pure original had, in some sense, been irretrievably lost. But what remained was not worthless. It was an inspired echo, a human reconstruction of the immutable will of God. And Irenaeus was hardly alone. Jerome appears to have shared this belief, as did many other late antique Christian authors. I would say this story was just late antique Mediterranean common sense. So we already knew that pseudepigraphic late antique Jewish writings like 4th Ezra offered Jewish versions of this story. But people don't always appreciate that the rabbis also circulated this narrative among themselves. So earlier big rabbinic accounts of a sort of Ezrin revelation or reconstruction appear in Tosefta Sanhedrin, in the Yushalmi and Megillah, in the Bavli and Sanhedrin again. Um, and they all tell ver different versions of this story. So what does that mean? I think that's a hard question to answer because for me, at least, it's never entirely clear how literally the authors of classical rabbinic tradition took the historical stories they told. So certainly late antique rabbis told many stories about the biblical text being lost or corrupted only to be saved from permanent error or oblivion by a special sage sent by God. And in these stories, the written Torah is periodically rescued um, and reconstructed by figures like Ezra the scribe in the late biblical period, the famous Hillel, you know, many other biblical characters and rabbinic sages. Uh, it's a bit like a game of telephone, right? Um, it goes from one to another. And the Mosaic revelation is, you know, is really far in the past of this game of telephone. So for me, the question was whether the rabbis who told these stories intended us to believe that these events actually happened, right? So like, that's what David Way Weiss Halivni once told us essentially. So in favor of this historical reading, we could point out that these narratives are often accompanied by really surprisingly gritty, gritty like epigraphic detail. So for example, rabbinic sources debate whether the Torah was originally written and what they call ketav libona, like brick writing or ostraca writing, um, inscription writing. So whether it came to be transcribed in that script during the first temple period or whether that was the original. But what that tells us is the rabbis had physical evidence that ancient Hebrew ostraca and inscriptions were recorded in a form of Hebrew writing very different from their low, like their own late antique Torah scrolls. And they were trying to figure out how historical evidence, that historical evidence fit in to their own quite imaginative narratives about how the biblical text had been corrupted and reconstructed. But on the other hand, we could just interpret these stories about a biblical game of telephone, like a form of narrative theorizing. I mean, the rabbinic authorities didn't exactly write philosophical treatises that walked a reader through their theoretical premises and a systematic outline, right? They weren't the Rishonim, they weren't the medieval sages. Instead, they often told us exemplar stories that convey their theoretical points through these paradigmatic examples or narratives. Um, 
an example that I think they also knew might never have occurred, right? So in that case, these stories about biblical texts that were lost and corrupted aren't meant to be taken literally as historical accounts. Instead, they're stories that warn about what can theoretically happen to written texts. So they become a form of like mythology about the vulnerability and unreliability reliability of um, sacred texts in a more general way, like a more abstract way. So in favor of that more metaphorical approach, I guess you'd say, we have to think about the fact that a significant portion of these stories actually focus on Moses and how he had to destroy the first tablets of the law that came down from Mount Sinai and offer and reconstruct a new version, right? This already happens in primordial time, way before history for them. So by bringing Moses into this pattern, the rabbis seem to be saying that this isn't really a historical problem. The Torah was always already vulnerable to corruption and loss from the very first moment it was given, because that's just how sacred text works. Scripts change, manuscripts are lost, rats eat the corner of your parchment, right? So for many late antique rabbis, I think written text was just not a reliable means of transmitting important traditions. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So a, a reminder that uh, actually uh, Dr. Wallingberg engages with rabbinic Judaism by placing it within a much wider uh, historical cultural milieu, um, engaging with uh, Christian texts as well, Second Temple Jewish texts. Um, and, and so it sounds like, because I just find this dichotomy very interesting that you critique. Uh, historical criticism has been obsessed with origins for a long time and re recuperating the original text. Uh, and that, uh, well, before the modern period, there was no uh, appreciation for this kind of question or critique, let's say, rather, of this kind of question. And actually, you're pointing out uh, not just to rabbinic texts, but other texts, we don't have the originals. Uh, and very often they had the text had to be recuperated. The text is maybe even a bit precarious uh, as a written text that needs to be preserved. So it, it opens a new way of looking at uh, how um, religious practitioners before the modern period engage with, um, with written scripture. In chapter two, you point to, to rabbinic texts from the late antique period that suggest that the written Torah was even a, a dangerous, lethal text, rather than, quote, a form of communication fruitfully available to any reader, end quote, on page 97. I think, for example, of the rabbinic passage from Tractate uh, Chagiga 13.8 in the Bafli about a poor child who, who reads the book of Ezekiel and comes to understand its uh, secrets, but then suddenly is burned by, by fire. Uh, consequently, they decide, in this, according to the story, to hide the biblical text. Um, what do the rabbinic texts such as these uh, tell us about the rabbinic engagement with the Bible in late antiquity? Right. So it's it's really extraordinary how many different ways a Torah scroll might kill you, according to the rabbis. It can zap you with lightning, as you said, that shoots out of the text and burns you up. Um, you might get zapped from lightning from heaven before you open the pit in which an like, important scroll is buried. Uh, treating a Torah scroll lightly can cause a massive plague, but treating a Torah scroll with too much honor can get you burned alive. Interacting with a Torah scroll outside of a synagogue reading is a really a dangerous business, right, in rabbinic lore. So what's that about? Um, in the book, I argue that the rabbis were afraid of Torah scrolls for the same reason they were afraid of their wives and daughters. So it worried them to have so much power packed into what they perceived as a vulnerable package. So okay, I'm going to leave the rabbinic sexual politics for those who want to read the book. Um, but when it comes to the Torah scroll, I think many early rabbinic thinkers were really unnerved by the idea that authentic manifest divine power could somehow be contained in a piece of animal skin that could be moved or stolen or desecrated or simply read and interpreted by any human being. It was like carrying a nuclear bomb around in a leather suitcase, right? It's a pretty dicey proposition at the best of times. So they told a lot of stories about explosions, essentially, right? These are, I think, that's what those stories are about. That is, they're telling stories about all the different ways that this strange object, um, which is both vulnerable and really powerful, could bring you and your entire community to a sticky end, 
um, if misused, right? It might feel like the Torah scroll was nothing much from a material standpoint, it's a small portable object you carry it around in the synagogue, right? It's under human control. You decide where to open it, where to read it. But there were invisible and unpredictable powers contained there, um, which could endanger the life of a community, whether that meant metaphorically or literally. Um, and I mean, sometimes literally, honestly, after the rise of Christianity, the way you reacted and used this, um, this shared book in an empire um, of arrival, like actually could have been dangerous. And the rabbis, I think, conveyed this almost philosophical, abstract, theoretical anxiety about the po power and vulnerability of written text with scary stories, stories that would make their audience stop and think and be cautious before they took any steps that might unleash the power of this strange object on the community. Would you say in part that's due to the fact that the, the written Bible is also now shared by other religious communities and that adds to, to the threat? The, the, the rabbinic Torah, so to speak, the oral Torah is in the hands of the rabbis, it's in their communities, but the biblical text, it's out there for other communities to interpret. Does that play a role as well? I think so. You know, originally when I wrote a dissertation on the topic, I was really taken with stories in which Jewish Christian encounters ended up in physical violence, right? Like biblical, strangely, um, exegetical disputes ended very quickly in strangling, right? And I thought, oh, that's the real, that's really what's going on here, right? But the more I thought about it, there was already a certain anxiety in the second temple period. And I think maybe if I were to speculate, the rise of Christianity literalized that sort of sense of danger and vulnerability and unpredictability. Like, oh, look, now we're actually seeing it happen socially also. And I think that just brought up a floodgate of other things they were worried about. I think that this was something that worried them on a very general abstract level, but definitely the rise of Christianity sort of brought that into the fore of the community imagination. Chapter three, at least for me, was the section of your book that I found to be the most intriguing. Uh, one prevailing notion in early uh, rabbinic exegesis was that the uh, they were, you know, the rabbis of the Talmud uh, were very attentive to the textual details of the biblical word. Uh, every every letter, every word, even. The yud, the crowns uh, of the text, they count. Um, however, you point out, and I'm quoting you here again uh, from page 103, quote, when one examines closely early rabbinic interpretive traditions that appear most ostentatiously engaged with various categories of textual minutiae, they are often revealed as purely performative rhetorical exercises. In many of these passages, scriptural exegesis that mimics close reading of a biblical text does not actually correspond to any written version of the biblical passage supposedly being studied and frequently fails to adhere to even the basic linguistic conventions of textual mm -hmm. meaning making, end quote. So what are the implications you draw from this observation for understanding how the early rabbis related to the written details of the biblical text? So I think my favorite example of this is a Yushalmi in the seventh chapter of Shabbat. It just elevates the nonchalance of all these rabbinic close, close readings to a positive principle. They say, this is how we do it. Okay, I'm going to read it to you. And I feel like this is a great example because if you're reading quickly, if you're doing dafyomi, you just read it and you don't necessarily know it, notice. But if you're reading a little more slowly, it takes a second for the shoe to drop. And then you think, wait, what? So here's the here's the midrash. These, ele, are the things that God commanded you to do. Labor on six days and on the seventh day will be a holy Sabbath to you. The rabbis of, Kis of Caesarea said, we derive the number 39 forbidden labors the number of things you're not allowed to do on Shabbat, from the gematria, the numerical calculations of the word these. Ele. Aleph is one, Lamed is 30, and Chet is eight, which adds up to 39. Ta-da! And you wait for a second, and you're like, wait, it's Ele. It's a hey, it's not a Chet. Ma. What are they doing? And they know that they're doing it because the next sentence is, well, the Yushami goes on, since the sages didn't refrain from explicating a verse to distinguish between hey and Chet, so you think about that for a second. This is basically a statement that technical, technically incorrect readings are just a 
they're characterized as a lack of finickiness, right? The sages don't let textual details get in the way of a good reading. So what is that about? I think that the rabbis were very taken with and leveraged a lot the idea that there could be a written manifestation of God's will. Um, but they like the idea more than the actual practical reality of that, right? So they play with the idea that this text is written very carefully and we look at the details and we count the letters, but then when they actually go about living with this text, they don't wanna be bothered with that stuff. And I think it's really hard for us as modern readers in the print age in the post-print age, to even conceptualize what that paradox looks like in their heads. I think for now, it's just enough for us to sit with the fact that that's how they were. They can say a whole midrash about the word nasa, about testing, as if it's nasa with a, you know, a sin, right? Like lifting up. And at the end, they say, oh, wait, that's the wrong word. And they just sort of shrug or laugh and move on. And it gets rewarded. It gets, you know, recorded for posterity in the mechilta, just like that. That's it. They never fix it. So what are we supposed to learn from that? I'm honestly not sure, except that the past really is a foreign country sometimes. Yeah, and we can multiply the examples. You know, I'm looking at page 104 of your book right now, uh, another passage. This is from, uh, let's see here, is it Sifre Deuteronomy, I think? Mm -hmm. uh, I might be wrong about that, about Sukkah. Uh, mm -hmm. Sukkah and where they they disregard the fact that, you know, it's, it's a discussion Well. Should there be two full walls and a third, or should there be, you know, uh, three full walls and, and a fourth wall? And uh, one view is makes its case by looking at Sukkot in the plural uh, of uh, the biblical text here in Leviticus 23, 42 to 43. The others um, look at the singular, the Sukkot. But I mean, they're, they're, they're disregarding the fact that Bisukat is in the construct if you're going to vocalize it in the singular. And that doesn't matter, uh, apparently, to them. <laughs> um, this is interesting. Maybe I would, as a follow-up question, is it precisely because they disregard these kind of grammatical details that they are paradoxically, in a certain way, attentive to detail? I don't know if you, you understand uh, my question. Uh, I, yes. I mean, do you mean that it's it's very functional for them? The detail isn't limiting, right? Because they're not taking it that seriously, it becomes a generative quality to pretend to attend to detail and you can do what you need to do with it and make new things that are beautiful and moving. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that comes out nowadays in like the modern biblical studies circles is that you are very constrained by the text and with the manuscripts, you know, wh which manuscript is correct? and you know, what this actually says. So in some ways it's very freeing for them, you know, to not be constrained by that. And all of a sudden you can love the detail again as a meaning maker, as a religious figure or whatever they're up to. It's very interesting. And you know, that sukkah, that sukkah example actually came up over Hag, over the holiday. Um, people have been bringing me other examples. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it. And they always bring me these, and they did the sukkah thing again, you know, and they're so indignant, but they're everywhere. Uh, we might follow up. I have some more questions about that, uh, but uh, to just move on here with the, the the sequence of the program, I ask maybe one more question before we allow our panelists to to join us. Um, if the rabbis weren't so invested in directly engaging with the the written text um, of the Bible as a communicative word or or source of information. How then did they interact with the Bible and view it as, as a sacred work? Right. What does it mean that these, you know, folks who told us in great detail how problematic this work could be built it as the symbolic center of their communal life? It's a really interesting question. So I actually think, you know, we're not really supposed to weigh in. We're supposed to be very descriptive, but I'm going to be a little prescriptive here um, as someone who's done religious studies and you see how communities function. I think the rabbis are pretty brilliant in this regard because by placing a closed book at the symbolic center of religious life, that empty signifier essentially could stand for anything and everything it needed to be. As long as people weren't reading it too closely, a divine message that isn't directly accessible is eternal and universal in a way that, you know, the actual Hebrew script of an ancient book set in a very particular tribal setting really just can't be, right? And rabbinic Judaism went through a lot in those first six or seven centuries of the common era, 
destruction of major institutions like the temple, huge geographical shifts, you know, as they start the center of gravity moves to Bavel, the rise and fall of entire empires around them. Um, how functional would it really have been to closely attend, like loyally and faithfully to the details of a book written in such a different context? I don't know. But by centering communal life on what was for all intents and purposes, a closed book, I think, the rabbinic system allowed these late antique rabbinic leaders to radically accommodate the times without being bound too tightly to a textual tradition that had been created for a very specific time and place. It really opens it up. Um, especially since that time and place for which it was created were so quickly fading out of Jewish life, right? Like the world was just changing too radically. So instead, the rabbinic practitioners could imagine a Torah to be anything they wanted, really. The most perfect book ever written that would say everything you needed to say in a chaotic and changing world. So I don't, I'm not suggesting that they were functionalists and they were doing this on purpose or in a conniving way, but I think that instinct they had really served them well and is probably the reason rabbinic Judaism ended up being you know, the dominant movement for a long time. Fascinating. Um, we're going to move here and provide some uh, time for the, the panelists to uh, respond to the question, the topic about the book, how the rabbis of the classical rabbinic period uh, related to the Bible. And what I suggest here is we'll just go by last uh, name in that order, starting with Professor Lehman, then Professor Lieber, and Professor Weiss. For the time being, we'll limit ourselves to about 15 minutes each, but uh, we might have uh, more time thereafter to, to add some more comments. Uh, Professor Lehman, uh, you're on. Um, hi, everybody. Um, and um, I just want to say that your last comment, Rebecca, I completely agree with that perspective. And um, I want to thank you so much for putting this book out there and also for certainly for those of us who are teaching rabbinics, for picking sources that are probably ones we teach over and over again, but for, you know, really giving us such a great collection of sources um, to um, address um, in our courses. Um, so given your book, it's given me a lot of time to kind of think of how I've come to my own understandings of the relationship between the rabbis and the Tanakh or the Bible. And I keep thinking back to sort of early moments as I'm learning um, about rabbinics. And uh, David Weiss Halivni was my mentor at, um, at Columbia when I did my PhD. And um, I specifically remember this class where um, he starts to talk about the Mishnah and how the Mishnah and it's kind of like, you know, not necessarily close relationship to um, uh, to scripture um, and how the Gemara, at least on the part of the Stamaim and maybe later the Saboraim, are very interested in relocating the Mishnah in the biblical text. And so they often will use a word like minalan or minahani mile, which basically is this question that's inserted because they're looking for the source that's going, meaning the biblical source that's going to locate the Mishnah in, in, you know, in Torah. Um, and so for me, when I'm teaching, I'm always reminding my students, I'm like, wait a minute, look, did the Mishnah really come from that particular pasuk, from that particular verse? What's happening here? So, um, so anyway, I, I, I do think that what has happened and what does erupt, as you said in your comments um, just a minute ago, is that there's this, the Bible is centering for them, no matter what, it's, it's centering. It, it, I don't understand how we're going to address, and maybe you want to address a little bit, the Mishnah versus, you know, Gemara or whatever, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit. But for, for sure, as rabbinic, um, uh, as, let's say, post-Mishnaic, conversations develop, um, the Gemara is going to be very centered um, on uh, the, the verses themselves. Now, I also just want to um, point out that this also sort of occurred to me that um, uh, it's not like when you look at the Munich manuscript or you look at a manuscript, you're going to see, I mean, the Pasuk or the verse will be quoted, but you're not going to necessarily see, well, this comes from Vayikra, Kavdalid, whatever, and you're going to have a place to go look to see in Leviticus where the verse is. You're going to need to kind of know that by memory. Um, but as the 
Talmud moves into print in Venice um, on the part of Bomberg, what we see immediately being scribed in on the margins of those printed um, uh, Talmuds is immediately reference to where you can find um, those um, quotes of the of the verses, which is extraordinary. Um, and so I just brought one. I'm just sharing it really quickly. This is a picture um, of um, uh, Psachim, um, a page from Bomberg. Um, I hope that you can see it here. And in the left hand corner, what you're already seeing, you see these little marks um, above verses. And you go out to the left-hand margin, and you can see here Eov Chaye Sarah, which is a, a reference to Genesis, and they'll take you right to the exact um, verse. Um, just going to stop my share. But what happens within 30 years, within 30 years of the Bomberg, you're going to have printings of the Talmud that will actually create an apparatus that is going to be in the margins of Talmuds forevermore, called the Torah Or, and it's gonna take you right to those verses. And then it develops, and I don't know if any of you have sort of, you know, used to teach from a, 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 you know, a Talmud where it had these little circles above the verses, and that would tell you, okay, there's a verse, you go out to the left-hand margin, you'd see that, okay, it says Leviticus 24, whatever, and you'd go look it up. But now the more recent, um, versions actually have the verses, like the entire verse. It may not be that the entire verse appears in the text itself, but it's going to be in the margin. And so there's this movement, and I think you really talk about this very beautifully in the book, of this movement to the recentering always back to that, you know, biblical text. It's, it's, we've got to go back there. But yet, when we go back there, what happens? Like you said, you find out that, wait a minute, it doesn't exactly um, help us. The, the reading isn't exactly um, as we would think it should be. Um, uh, and various readings hang on, um, you know, sort of ludicrous on some level readings of, of, of these verses sometimes. Um, so anyway, so I guess I'm trying to make the point um, that the rabbis knew for sure um, that whatever verse they quoted um, was um, you know, they were going to argue that it was the law of the Mishnah was somehow rooted in that verse. But I think the real question is, like, what does rootedness mean? What, what, what is what what is the how do we define that for our students? Rootedness is a very loaded word. I mean, I think you're really helping us to to um, define that and to understand that. Um, I, I often tell my students, and this is really the point I want to make. Um, because we definitely see in the rabbis, you know, this, this like, um, you know, movement from utter creativity to utter dishonesty. Like there's this back and forth between the dishonesty and the creativity. Um, and I often tell my students that um, ideology um, is going to be a compelling force in the way we choose to read the rabbi's way of reading biblical texts, but more so in the ways we understand the rabbis and their project. In many ways, it's all in the eyes of the reader. If a, you know, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, I think what you're helping us to see and to really contemplate are reading practices. How does one read a text? And I'm not sure that any of us ever really read those texts with pure objectivity. We ourselves don't read objectively. We often bring our own biases naturally. I think that's a natural part of the reading process. And so it shouldn't be surprising to us that the rabbis too were doing that similar, it was a similar kind of relationship to this text where they read into it what they wanted to see. Um, and then the question is, does it stick? So they read something in depending on how successful they are, and that success is going to be rooted in the way a reader interprets that success. And so it is again up to the reader to then accept or not accept the reading and then pass it down to the next generation. 
Um, and it's so interesting to me which readings stick and, and which don't, I mean, over time. Um, but I, I definitely think that um, what you're opening us up for here is this really interesting examination of reading practices and how we read um, and um, how we read and paralleling how the rabbis read. We are so comfortable saying, and I think this is so extraordinary, we're so comfortable saying that the rabbis had an agenda, they read with a certain eye towards something that they wanted to address, and even if they didn't really pull it out of the verse, they wanted to communicate, so they had this motivating external force behind why they wanted to pick that verse and push the reading, or let's say overread. Um, so I, I mean, that is there, but yet we don't critique ourselves and our own reading practices and say the same of ourselves, which I, you know, find like very, very interesting. Um, and so this takes me back to, again, my graduate school experience where we would always, um, uh, we would um, always be asked when we read a scholarly article to find out who the author is and anything we could find out about that author. Um, and then address whether or not we felt there was some kind of relationship between where that author was coming from and what it was they were interpreting or writing about rabbinic literature, or in some cases it was just, you know, religion writ large, depending on what the course was. But I just thought it was so, it was interesting that that's kind of how, that's my training. And yet very often today, reading is done with such blinders and I don't know I I, I just feel like it, you, you know it's really important for us as as professors who walk into the classroom to really remind our students that if we're going to judge the rabbis in any way we also need to judge ourselves and we also need to understand that as readers we always bring our own ideologies and experiences and lenses to the text themselves. I mean, I'm interested in gender. I'm female. <laughs> so, I mean, yes, there's a connection there. Um, anyway, so I, I just, you know, I, so, I sort of just wanted to kind of raise that and bring that bring that to, to a head. Um, but what I, I also thought, you know, uh, what I loved so much about your book is you really named the struggle between the fear that the rabbis possess of their own power to read the biblical texts, which I think you're getting at in chapter two, and their desire to ensure some sort of longevity and success, and how utterly dangerous it might be to possess the authority as a rabbi to read biblical texts and to tell people this is what they say, but at the same time how inspiring it is to think that you actually hold the keys to unlocking the Bible's secrets. Um, and the rabbis are really brilliant here because they're trying to connect to the Bible on the one hand, but they're also using it to disconnect from it as well. So it's dangerous and invigorating. They connect to disconnect, which means they use the Bible to give them just enough power to create something that has the dynamism to keep accommodating another generation of minds who want some degree of connection to and disconnection from a prior um, generation, which I think is just extraordinary. Um, and I even think of my own book on Yoma, I wrote on Tractate Yoma, and there it's clear that the biblical Yom Kippur is informing the whole tractate, and yet that biblical Yom Kippur and the temple service is really there, but yet they're really, the rhetoric is to sort of push back against the temple. The rhetoric is really not, they're not in favor of recreating and rebuilding that temple. Um, anyway, so um, so I, I just wanted to, um, you know, point that out. I'm wondering, um, and um, I'm just going to sort of, uh, you know, kind of wrap up a little bit. Um, and by the way, I love chapter six. I, I love the way that you talk about that closed book, that closed scroll, how it becomes the ritual object, how, I mean, I really see that um, and, and feel that, that, you know, you have this object that's ageless and timeless and that sits in the middle of a community, but yet the amount of creativity that exudes from it is, is pretty extraordinary. So I, I love that, um, that image and I love that chapter very much. Um, but I was wondering, 
um, also if if we are about, I was wondering if you would just give us a little bit more background um, about how you came to this, to writing this book. Like what what was sort of the driving forces behind wanting to get this book um, out there? And, um, you know, sort of what, like what interested you um, in, in writing this? And I, I just kind of want to, I'm not trying to say that again, that it's not objective scholarship, but I do believe that there is something that drives us and motivates us to produce something. And I'm wondering if you would tap into that a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think especially when you're talking in the realm of legal development or halakha um, and the desire to really want to see the, the, uh, the rabbis as creative beings, how that lands um, certainly among people who really want to use rabbinic um, tradition as the for, you know, as the foreground for their lives, um, you know, how does all of that creativity um, and invigoration and all of that sort of land then um, in, you know, in those conversations? So it's like sort of two questions, one sort of where you're coming from and also, you know, just to sort of tap into kind of maybe the legal um, aspects of, of the biblical text and, and rabbinic literature and where this might, might take us. So. Thank you, uh, Professor Lehman. Uh, Professor Weinberg, would you like to respond to that question immediately? I think it's a it's a good question to just ask here right away. What led you to write this book? So, you know, it's funny. This is one I see in much of my work. The agenda is very clear to me. This is one of the few times I've done something where an intellectual question started it, but it changed how I think about, you know, my, my own social life. Um, I was working with Jim Robinson at University of Chicago on Rishonim. And I or and Geonium and Roshonium, like medieval sages. And I was really just taken aback that so many of them were concerned that the Bible appeared to be a bit of a bad book. And they were trying to figure out how to rehabilitate it. You know, Sajigon's commentary on Genesis begins, you might think this is a bad monograph because it goes out of order and he jumps around and you know, it was God a bad editor. No, no, here's how it works. And trying to, you know, fit this book into a sort of medieval philosophical you know, treatise kind of model. And I kept encountering that in our readings and I thought, what is that about? So I went to write a dissertation on that. And um, every time I put in a fellowship application, you know, or something about this, people would say, no, no, that can't possibly be right. The rabbis always thought this was a perfect book. This question makes no sense. There were people who were confused. So I'd write a chapter, I'd say, no, no, actually, I don't think they thought it was a perfect book. You have all these, you know, midrashim on, you know, corrupted texts. And I'd you know, do that and I'd respond and they would still be confused about some other aspect of it. And by the time I was done, I had 400 pages of explanation about why I should be allowed to write about the Rishonim. And Jim was like, I'm sorry, Rebecca, um, bye. <laughs> like that's a dissertation in itself. So we just finished it. Um, but you know, over the years, I've, to be totally full disclosure, become a lot less orthodox. As I read this and I see how much dynamism and how much movement and how much, you know, a sort of kind of flexible relationship with these texts um, the founders of the movement had, it's definitely changed the way I do a lot of things. Um, so I think in this case, it went backwards. I didn't come in with that agenda, but now I have that agenda. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we'll proceed to Professor Lieber um, and listen to your response. Thank you. Um, great. Um, I want to begin by uh, thanking Isaac and Joshua and the Enoch Seminar for the invitation to speak, and especially thank Rebecca for the gift of this book. I think um, I also found myself in some ways, at some level, responding to this book, both as a student and a teacher, because I think it addresses many of the things that both I remember as a student of rabbinic literature, when I was first encountering the rabbis, and because I didn't grow up reading rabbinic literature, and I came to rabbinic literature as an English major. Uh, well, had, I just graduated with an English degree in the late 90s when postmodernism was all the thing. And to me, the rabbis were sort of the first postmodernists, and they seemed uh, so 
progressive in their own way for not being as bound to the text and the idea that the consonants were canonized but in the, the vowels were the first level of commentary and the sort of the way that we spoke about the rabbinic relationship and the Masoretic relationship to the biblical text is something that you do such a beautiful job of sort of taking that sort of understanding that I had, you know, from 25 years ago and really making it significantly more sophisticated. At the same time, um, providing those of us who are teaching now with sort of resources for helping students who come into our classrooms with a very uh, simple understanding of what people way back thought about the Bible versus what people today do or should think about the biblical text. And, um, and it's just so beautifully articulated and uh, and I think there's just so much for people to think about and it invites, it's a really very inviting book. Uh, I think you're, you're, it's a, it's a, it invites conversation, it invites argument. And I also really like uh, the way that you present the emotional ri richness of study because I think both the there, I think in some ways the there's the the first part of the book, which is sort of about the joy of Torah study and the sort of the playfulness of the text. And I think sometimes when we're studying, you know, some some texts are full of that joy and cleverness and look what I made the text do. And then other times there's the anxiety of, um, oh no, look what I made the text do. And do, should I have that power? And can I let that text out in the wild? And, uh, and you know, and there were moments, you know, even as you were speaking and as, you know, sort of that, um, even the conversation you just had, that, that in a way, this is almost a microcosm of what it's like to be a teacher, a professor nowadays, that sort of like, on the one hand, it can be a great pleasure. Sometimes we worry about the power we have and other times we wonder if anyone's listening, uh, do we have any power uh, sort of uh, at all in terms of shaping how people understand sort of the various texts that we teach. So um, I think for me, I, I sort of thought with the time that I was given, it probably made the most sense for me to reflect on how I think, because you do such a beautiful job of you know, working with uh, sort of rabbinic exegesis and rabbinic ways of reading and presenting their thoughts about, really sort of highlighting the way the rabbis were very, very self-conscious about how they were reading. And in uh, at the beginning of chapter five, you actually talk about some, Pute a little bit. And I thought uh, that really made me aware of the fact that, you know, Pute liturgical poetry as a genre um, compared to rabbinic prose writing, because really Pute is sort of a poetic version of rabbinic writing, uh, doesn't seem as anxious. Uh, I'm not sure it really actually seems as joyful either, just because we don't really have any texts where the Paitanim, the authors of these poetic texts, theorize about what they're doing. We don't have any sort of theoretical works from late antiquity where the liturgical poets write about doing poetry. So we have the art, but not the musings of the artists. And this changes in the medieval period where we get much more writing uh, about poetry and on poetry. And we get uh, the Hasidic Ashkenaz uh, not only fixing the letters of the poetry, but writing comment commentaries on the liturgical poetry and sort of the writtenness of everything becomes much more significant. Um, but it, I thought that in terms of how the Paitanim and the, you know, the liturgical poets relate to the writtenness of the biblical text and how they, at the same time, they are clearly a part of rabbinic culture is sort of an interesting way of thinking through some of the issues that you raise, because I think they actually just enriches and shows how I think what you are laying out here really is just sort of the leading edge of a whole sort of new way of thinking about sort of the way the rabbis think about the biblical text. And um, so 
in liturgical texts in the PU team, the they're really their mosaics made out of words and phrases from the biblical text. Uh, Peter Cole, uh, the great, who's a great poet and translator of uh, Hebrew poetry himself, once described the PU team as if someone had written the Torah on glass and then shattered it and then made little mosaics out of it. So the, the very words of the PU team are often sort of rearranged words of the Torah. And in liturgical poetry, the idea of Torah can be very important and the Torah can be an important symbol. But at the same time, I think you're very right to remind us that just because Torah can be very present in so many different ways, we cannot just therefore impose our own assumptions about what a written text should mean or do onto the Pew team as a rabbinic text. I think um, you made me actually sort of want to go back and do kind of a deep dive into the differences in the role that Torah plays in say Hebrew poetry versus Aramaic poetry, Jewish Aramaic poetry and Samaritan poetry, the Torah actually is different in each of these genres. Rabbinic Torah in the Hebrew poetry is, I would say, even though we have much more Hebrew poetry than we have Jewish Aramaic poetry or Samaritan poetry, Torah is probably less prominent as a symbol, you know, sort of capital T Torah, than it is in the Jewish Aramaic poetry, or certainly Samaritan poetry, Torah is extremely important in the Samaritan poetry. But at the same time, in all three genres, Moses and Sinai are extremely important, but not the halakha of what any of these things are doing. As I mentioned, the PU team are made up of the very words of Torah. You really, I think, get the sense when you're reading the PU team or if you hear them in a synagogue today, because many of these PU team uh, continue to be parts of the liturgy and synagogues to the present day. You can sense and this is sort of where uh, Rebecca's idea of sort of the the um, the third uh, sort of the third text comes into play, that there's this deep knowledge of what we think of as the written text comes into play, which is why the first stage of publishing a previously unknown pute text. So if someone finds you know there's a Geniza text and someone wants to publish a critical edition, the very first stage is going through and footnoting the living daylights out of it with all the uh, references to biblical texts and um, and also to rabbinic works. But, you know, but at the same time, you don't think, you don't imagine that the person writing it was sitting there with a concordance. You know, the person, it's like the text is sort of almost emerging out of them and that they're cleverly sort of like reassembling these words out of their imagination. And then so what, you, what happens, I think, in a way is sort of the idea that it's as if a scripture, which is not even, I mean, I, in my little notes here, I have sort of written scripture is reoralized, but it's not even really a written scripture because it's an embodied scripture. It's in the poet's body and you know, it's in their mind and they are sort of reoralizing it during performance, which means in a, when we read a written text of a pute, it actually has an ambiguity in it that it probably doesn't have in its original biblical written context. It may have when the rabbis read it, because they take it out of that context. It has it when it's taken out of that context in the piyut. And one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is how in performance, the interpreter who's performing it has to sort of also take away some of the ambiguity, hopefully. And this just serves as a reminder of how important setting is because the Bible is at the center of many liturgical poems, the Torah in specific, because many of the poems are built around the weekly parasha the weekly parasha and the haftarah. So you can't say the Torah is not important because they are actually sort of built around the weekly reading and they sort of lead into it. And so ritually, the Torah is important. The haftarah is part of it. But at the same time, many of them, uh, many of these poems have, they introduce, you know, the first verse of the Torah, the parasha, and then they, but then they follow them with a catalog of verses that in some way relate to that first verse. So it's not as if it's followed by reading of the first, say, the first aliyah or something. So what you understand is that the hearing the Torah in some way is central to this in the synagogue, but the catalog of verses breaks the Bible up. So, and which is very similar in some ways to the Florilegia that we have in the Samaritan Defter, the Samaritan prayer book, which is a little synopsis of the biblical book. You didn't hear the whole book of Exodus, you heard sort of enough verses to get sort of like a reader's digest version of it. 
And so the biblical text in the synagogue, in these sort of liturgical poems, um, or in the Samaritan Defter is sort of linear and not linear. And the joy of hearing these passages seems to be in the intertextuality rather than in a simple linear textuality. And as the, in these Yanai's Pew team, for example, as the poems progress, we actually hear shorter and shorter passages from the biblical verses. We get fewer and fewer full quotations of biblical verses and more and more very short pithy phrases uh, as the passage, you know, from the week's parsha is being distilled to a sort of what I think of as a participatory essence, it becomes more and more of a participatory refrain. And the focus is not so much on conveying meaning to the congregation, which is there in the synagogue, in the case of these poems, as part of sort of the Shabbat service, not on, the focus is not on, um, conveying a lesson to them or sort of teaching them a meaning or edifying them in some way, but rather in drawing the community into the experience of hearing the PU team and participating in the performance of the PU team. And rather than creating some kind of distance between them and this idealized Torah, which is um, magnificent, but far away, it's actually collapsing the distance between them and Sinai. And so I guess sort of in closing, I would say that in some ways from the perspective of the liturgical poetry, on the one hand, as you note at the end of the book, you know, that this Torah is a very powerful symbol precisely because it's a closed book. But at the same time, through the liturgical poetry and the way that closed book is experienced in this liturgical setting through things like these liturgical poems, at least as the way this closed book is encountered in the synagogue, it is constantly sort of reopened and um, re-experienced. And I think there's sort of the, the way the synagogue tries to sort of collapse the distance between the present moment and Sinai. Maybe I think what you're tapping into is that there's really a sort of powerful tension built into the ritual aspects of rabbinic culture. I think there's almost there's the intellectual aspects of rabbinic culture, and then there are these ritual aspects of rabbinic culture and uh, and sort of the dynamic energy between the two that the rituals of rabbinic Judaism create these very powerful moments where the community is standing again at Sinai and um, and that whatever happened to corrupt the Torah to you know with golden calves and all that other stuff it's sort of it's it's that is a uh, by the wayside, because this is the Torah that God gave to Moses, and the community is there receiving it themselves. So anyway, that's, those were some of the exciting uh, thoughts that I had. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lieber, for, for sharing those comments. And as you were um, reflecting on that, it occurred to the occurred to me that maybe, uh, I could ask uh, you, Professor Wallenberg, to comment a bit on this notion of the, the third Torah uh, in, in your book. Right? We have, of course, in rabbinic Judaism, the notion of two Torahs, the Torah Shebichtav, the written Torah, largely speaking, scripture, the Bible, the Tanakh, and then the oral Torah, uh, which eventually morphs into, well, a written text as well, paradoxically, the Mishnah, the Gemara, rabbinic Midrash. Uh, but then in your book, you have this intriguing um, thesis about a third uh, Torah. Um, could you maybe for, for our audience share a few words uh, about that? So I feel like I just like understood something when Laura was talking I hadn't understood before. I'll tell you what I said, and now I'm going to say what I think now. But um, uh, the third Torah, the way I was imagining it was like, you know, you always have these stories. The rabbis are walking down the road. Someone wants to know a question about what you do. And they pull out some verse in their own oral archive, the third Torah that's in their head, right? It's not really rabbinic oral tradition. They have a Rebbe who told them something. That's one part of their thought. And then they have this version of the Bible, all the, you know, verses they've collected over the years, they learned as a child, whatever it is, and that they can pull out and access in these moments. And, you know, I thought of it mostly, honestly, the rabbis do talk about Sinai a lot. They talk about this third Torah as something that's being passed down, almost like a French kiss from student to, you know, to uh, from teacher to student, from parent to child, like there is some of that, um, like almost material reality 
in that those discussions, like this is the real Torah. I'm giving you a tiny taste of what God really said. Um, and that's fine. That's the third Torah, right? It stands in this in-between space. It's your sort of memory archive of what you think this text is. But as Laura was talking, I, you know, I even quote some of the places in the book and I had not understood them. Whenever the rabbis talk about the synagogue experience, it's like they're re-experiencing Sinai. They say the person doing Kriya, the person doing the reading, that's God, the person doing the, you know, Targum that's doing the translation, and that's Moshe. And you're, you know, you're re-experiencing this in synagogue. And I hadn't thought about it, but especially when you add the piyut in, right? Like all the parts of the service that are going to change week to week, month to month, or how, you know, however it's going to work as you go along, right? You it's participatory. So that really is the Sinai. It's I was imagining it as this long chain of like weirdly fringe kissing rabbis, right? So you taste the honey of Sinai at a long distance. But I like this because actually I think that it's true that they experience that as a reinvigoration and a re-giving you know, over and over. And that's really interesting. That's all I've got. I like changing my mind. I'm just I'm conveying enthusiasm more than content here. So. Okay, thank you for sharing that. We'll proceed to Professor Weiss. Okay, great, yeah. It's uh, good uh, getting a chance to hear everyone else's comments first. Uh, but uh, yeah, I thought, um, first to say of uh, one key thing, I think the book does a really important job of highlighting the way in which the classical rabbinic conception of what is scripture and how to engage with it, of uh, showing how that really differs from many contemporary notions of text and reading, that people uh, have a basic notion of reading and maybe you'll read different texts in the course of your life, but you have one basic thing that you know what reading is. And I feel like the book uh, does a really good job of showing that actually the classical rabbinic basic notion of what it means to engage with the text may be very different from most people's contemporary notions. Uh, but the way in which many of the contemporary notions of what reading basically is has filtered into scholarship about rabbinic texts and given us maybe a, a misperception of what was going on. So that that uh, so avoiding uh, you know conceptual anachronism, you know, uh, but which is very hard to do. So the, uh, you know, we we throughout the whole book we're treated to uh, uh, different ways of seeing how the rabbis uh, their basic notion of reading was different than ours might be. And I think the key thing also comes in in the conclusion section about how uh, the classical rabbinic notion of reading uh, is different from various medieval Jewish notions of reading and of books. And of somehow, uh, I, so, I suppose that a certain notion of reading correlates with a certain notion of book. And so the medieval notion of reading then turns the biblical text into a, a book of a certain type, which might be more similar to our contemporary notions of book. Uh, whereas the classical rabbinic notion uh, as uh, a, a different notion of reading also means that the thing that's read, the book, is something qualitatively different than what we might think of as a book, even if it might physically look the same. The the relationship makes it into something different. Uh, and so then, uh, and then actually also to add showing the book, uh, Rebecca's book also shows how it, uh, the rabbinic approach differs from other late antique approaches to scripture. Uh, so, right, it might be different from Christian approaches to scripture, or from non-rabbinic Jewish approaches to scripture. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, possibly a distinct thing. And uh, and then it, it leaves us the question also of how to characterize this something different. You know, saying that it's different from contemporary modes. So that can still leave us with multiple options of how precisely to characterize what is this different thing that they're doing. And it's, um, uh, I think uh, one key thing that gets brought out then is the, uh, the role of the orally recited form of scripture, the read recited notion of uh, Korean as uh, the, the, the rabbinic term for reading. Uh, well, uh, the rabbinic term that's often translated to English as reading uh, could just as easily potentially be translated into English as reciting and having that oral out loud element, which, which uh, Rebecca highlights. Uh, and what that does to the notion of, a, of the act of reading or of a book uh, or what a text is. Uh, and especially one key thing that is brought up in various places is the notion of uh, the vocalization isn't found in the ink and parchment version itself. And both this has to do with the rabbinic uh, orthography of the Torah scrolls and the other texts. They're written with the consonants. And at this time period, you know, and include as, as well as Torah scrolls still today, uh, not written with the vowels, with the vocalization in there, with the pointing, 
Uh, and so the, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess one difference that comes out is that today, you know, the Torah scroll might be written without the, without the vowels, but people can go look at a version with the vowels. You know, if you're preparing for read from the Torah, you can practice by looking at a written text that has the vowels written there. And I think the key thing is in, that comes across is that in the rabbinic culture, uh, they weren't working with any, with versions of the written text that had vowels in it, even for practicing. Uh, that the notion of the, the vocalization was something you learned from hearing someone else teach you how to do it, that it was an oral tradition. Uh, and it's, um, so you're, the, the, the written text is specifically consonants and the, the vowels are specifically oral tradition. Uh, and so that, um, that aspect where then the recited version requires other people and can't be gotten not only from the written Torah, the Torah scroll itself, but really from any written text. It's, it's something you get from other people and have to uh, learn from other people, I think is a, a key thing that, uh, that comes across. And so the thing I wanted to uh, bring in, I guess some of the other uh, panelists brought in different elements, say piyut, how piyut can illuminate it in different ways. The, the element I wanna bring in is the aspect of uh, um, the classical rabbinic practice and theory of Midrash, uh, which is interesting, which doesn't really come up much in your book, but I felt was sort of uh, uh, many of the interesting things you're proposing could be, uh, I, I want to say, ah, oh, okay, that, that's cool. How could we, what would that look like if we put it alongside uh, different discussions of Midrash and what, how, they, how they understand the scriptural text in the practice of Midrash? Uh, and uh, I think the one thing uh, that, uh, you know, people have written about different elements of Midrash, but one, the one element I want to highlight is the way in which they, uh, classical rabbinic texts uh, seem to treat scripture, so the, re the revealed text of written scripture, uh, the aspect of it being open to multiple different readings. Uh, and, uh, and at least one way that they seem to conceive of this is partially because they conceive of the written text as consisting only of consonants. Uh, that because the vocalization is not found in the written text, uh, but is added by people engaging with the text or, and or by learning uh, oral traditions, uh, there's a way in which the, the absence of vowels in the written text can correlate with multiple different readings. As you know, if you have a, a certain a set of consonants, uh, that can be vocalized in different possible ways. And if the thing that's revealed in the written form is the just the consonants, uh, then that uh, makes the possibility of multiple different interpretations um, more possible, it, it seems, in their conception of what scripture is. Uh, and I think if one looks then at this their approach to Midrash and interpretation, one finds uh, a notion of scripture that uh, is also not equivalent to an informational message, uh, right? It's not that there's a, a starting message that the, the scriptural verse says something, and then we're gonna give an allegorical reading uh, or you know, different types of uh, additional readings. In their uh, understanding, if you just have the consonants, there is no starting informational message that any interpretation uh, is going to be an additional step uh, by the human reader. Uh, and so there's no information, there are no words to start with. Words have vowels, uh, sentences have vowels uh, to have meaning, but the, the scripture starts out as just consonants. Uh, and so the, uh, in that sense, it's not an informational message, but I, what I wanted to potentially propose and see, Rebecca, what you think of this, is whether, because uh, I feel like you you highlight the way in which they don't treat scripture as an informational message, uh, but in many cases you uh, argue that, that they move away from the written text, treating it as more closed. Uh, and in one sense, a closed book would not be an informational message, so that would fit. But I wonder whether, uh, what would you think of the, the notion that they treat the scriptural text as something one could call a hyper open text? Uh, which is also different from an open text in the ways you highlight, right? You're, you're, you argue that they don't seem to treat the text as an open text that just has a message that's open that you can read uh, directly, gain meaning from just from reading it uh, in the way we think of reading a text today. Uh, but I wonder whether uh, the notion of a text that's only consonants is uh, doesn't give a direct informational message, but in a sense is hyper open in the sense that there can be too many readings that can come out of it. And so it's... Uh, and so in some ways, how is a hyper open text similar to a closed text? 
but maybe different in some other ways. Uh, uh, but especially that neither of them are informational, uh, informational message in that way. Uh, and I think, I wonder, in that regard, the notion of the oral recitation component uh, would also still be very important uh, because there's this notion that they uh, focus on memorizing the biblical text in the way you described, uh, that it's not just engaging with it in its written form, but also memorizing a certain recited version. And I think there might be some ways in which their midrashic practice might tie into that because they're so familiar with the certain recited version that they've memorized. Uh, but at the same time, if they view the scriptural text as the consonants, uh, therefore open to multiple meanings, they can then uh, give midrashic interpretations that, uh, if you imagine the audience in a homiletic midrash and coming up with a very unexpected reading of the uh, consonantal text, the reason it's so unexpected can be because they have a expect, an expected version that they have uh, memorized orally, a certain vocalization that they're very familiar with uh, in that memorized sense. So that when they um, uh, can then give an alternate version, it will catch them by surprise, but then it will be a good midrash. So yeah, that's a good one, uh, precisely because of that, uh, that tension there. Um, and I think uh, the the one other element I wanted to highlight is this question of how it relates to divine revelation. You highlight this question of, of does uh, uh, the written text as they have it today doesn't necessarily correlate directly to the original revelation. And the question of whether the oral recited version of the scriptural text is that closer to the divine revelation. And I wasn't, it wasn't sure that, I don't know if, whether they treat them in one being closer or not closer than the other. Uh, because I do think they, on the one hand, they treat the human writing, the form of the writing we have the Torah in today, is different from the original divine speech and different from the original divine writing. So there is a gap in the way you highlight. But I think they might also treat the, the human recited version, the oral recited Torah, as also different. The, the, the human speech, the human recited version, is different from the divine speech, the original one. Uh, and whether it might be in their framing that it might be the combination of having the written text on the one hand and the recited version uh, that can uh, that together one can access revelation and that uh, each of those two, the written text with the consonants without the vowels and then the recited version, uh, which has the vowels, each of them might have something similar to revelation that the other one doesn't have. So the recited version has the livingness, the, the spokenness, uh, which as you show, uh, they conceive of the original revelations being spoken. Uh, on the other hand, human speech only captures one meaning uh, in a, a sentence. So even the traditional recited version is still uh, could be seen as um, putting a finite by vocalizing and giving it actual uh, words. It sort of limits it a bit. And whether then the precisely the written version, uh, which isn't words but just consonants, but can be can generate multiple different uh, interpretations, in some ways might point back to the character of the divine oral speech, the divine speech which had contained multiple different uh, possibilities within the spoken uh, form of the divine speech, whereas human speech doesn't capture multiple meanings in the same way in a, in a spoken form. So whether it's, um, whether maybe neither the human speech nor the human writing capture the divine revelation, but somehow working with them together enables them to go, uh, to go in some ways going back and forth between the two. Uh, so, uh, and I wonder whether this could be uh, in relation to the question of the danger that they, you, you treat them as treating the written text as dangerous. And I think that, that I agree with that characterization. And I guess the question would be, what does a dangerous text mean one should do with it? Because uh, there could be some notion to say, oh, if a text is dangerous, maybe we shouldn't read it too much. We should avoid it. And I actually didn't see the, in the rabbinic passages you looked at, them saying that actually that one shouldn't engage with the written text, uh, we could talk about some of the specific passages, but that it was uh, that the dangerousness meant you have to be careful about how you engage. Uh, and I think especially this might be in a community where is we see from their midrashic practices, this is a community of people who are engaging with the scriptural text a lot and coming up with different interpretations, et cetera. So, so whether some of the danger, uh, the passage you highlight that talk about the danger of the written text could be, uh, yes, we know you're engaging with the written text a lot. It's not that we want you to not engage with, but you need to be very careful uh, in how you do it. And it, uh, it reminded me a bit of um, 
Pierre Ados in his uh, philosophy as a way of life, the way he characterizes the uh, spiritual exercises of in uh, different late antique contexts. I think he has an example of uh, Marcus Aurelius uh, giving uh, writing text, text from Marcus Aurelius that seem to portray human life in very pessimistic terms. Uh, and he argues that this is not because Marcus Aurelius uh, thought that you should spend all day thinking of how a horrible human life is and how uh, human life is nothingness or a rotting corpse, uh, but rather that uh, Marcus Aurelius might think you should focus on that, use those texts and focus on the negative elements 15 minutes every morning so that then you can go about the rest of your day and have a counterbalance the tendency you might have uh, in other ways, but that's not, not, that's not the only picture. And whether some of the the danger elements might be uh, not so that the, they're encouraging people not to engage with the text, but to counterbalance potential dangers that they, these uh, people in the rabbinic circle might otherwise have of uh, placing too much weight on the written text. Uh, and I so I think uh, in closing, I wonder whether it could be uh, something more like ra rather than saying don't engage with the text, it would be some of the passages you highlight could be don't treat the written text as an end in itself. Uh, and that it could be prob very problematic if treated as an end in itself. It needs to be uh, engaged alongside the oral tradition and the elements of oral recitation. Uh, and so that the, uh, so something, to say something shouldn't be treated as an end in itself. There could be some things that aren't an end in itself that you shouldn't engage at all. But there could be other things that aren't an end in itself that should be, oh yes, you should engage it, but make sure you don't uh, you know, uh, place too much weight on it in isolation. And I think the part you brought out, especially with the interreligious danger of sectarianism with the Ben Dama story, I think was really interesting. The role there that of if someone is merely citing proof texts, you can get anything from that. Uh, and so that, that, uh, that could be the flip side of their, the fact they like the fact you can get lots of interpretations. Uh, on the other hand, you could get even problematic ones and therefore there needs to be uh, there's a danger, some type of balancing that needs to go on. Uh, but whether, you know, this notion of the, uh, and then I don't know whether it would raise a question of the the, the oral recited version, whether it would, would it be a third Torah as something separate or whether it would be two different forms of the written Torah. These, uh, there's the written, there's the Torah Shabbat Tav, which has a written form, which doesn't have vowels. And then the Torah Shabbat Tav has an oral form. So an oral written form and an or and a, written, written form, uh, and whether it's something, those are these two sides of the uh, the written Torah. Uh, and the, uh, I think one thing that just to close on would be that um, whether when the, the question for you, when they're thinking or talking about the recited version of the, of the scriptural text, it seemed to me that they are conceiving of it always as something that you're reciting uh, in relation to a written text, right? Even if they sometimes are doing reciting without a written text in front of them, the thing that you're reciting is always conceived of as connected to a written text and whether the thing they're memorizing then, which comes out in some of the passages you look at, is that they're uh, memorizing not just the orally recited form, but they're also memorizing the consonants, the written consonants, uh, and as well as memorizing a certain way of vocalizing them. But somehow the, the consonants also become part of the uh, memorized thing, which then can enable them to uh, generate other interpretations from those from those memorized consonants. And the uh, I think verbally, one thing that uh, this is a small point to end with is the um, the notion of Korean and Shonin, right? Of the uh, I thought it's interesting. You show how uh, sometimes they talk about uh, uh, one might engage with scriptural text as Shonin of repeating, which is the term they often also use for the say Mishnaic traditions of uh, rabbinic traditions. I think it's notable they never use the term Korean in relation to rabbinic traditions, so that it's uh, the uh, the terms aren't interchangeable in that direction. And whether there's something that the rabbinic uh, texts are oral texts that are only oral, uh, they're oral versions of an oral text, whereas the uh, even the recited version of the Torah is always a oral version of a written text, and so the writtenness doesn't go away in some sense. Uh, Anyway, that, that's not a clear uh, conclusion, but anyway, thank you for your book. It raised a lot of really great questions. And I, as other people said, it's really great for, I think, for students and teachers to engage with, to challenge uh, typical understandings. Uh, 
Thank you, Daniel. There, there's a lot to, to think uh, there. Before giving an opportunity to uh, Rebecca to, to respond, what I suggest is, uh, since uh, the Professor Michal Bar Asher Segal has joined us, uh, to allow her to maybe just share uh, a response, and then we'll open the floor. Uh, Laura, uh, I'm told uh, via Jaka, also has a question for you. Um, Rebecca, just to fill you in, um, uh, Michal, everyone has shared a, a brief uh, response. Of course uh, they did. Uh, and uh, we're very happy you've been able to join us. Um, if you'd like to, to share a few comments yourself, you're more than welcome to do so now. I do. First, I need to apologize because I was so proud of myself. So my flight was detained by two hours. So I was like, and I wrote to you all an email and I said, you know, but I'll make it in time and I'll, you know, get up from the, in the, the from the taxi. And when I got on, it was very obviously that I didn't calculate the time difference that changed our clock change and your clock change. So I'm like an hour behind. So this is really a very good example for the difference between oral Torah and written Torah and time difference. And so, uh, again, my apologies really sincerely for uh, um, uh, for being late. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry also for not hearing what everyone else was saying besides, uh, Daniel, uh, but, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Isaac, do you want me to do the full, you know, what I prepared? Is that okay that I do that? That's fine. You have about 15 oh. minutes to do so, and then we'll still have time for some discussion if you'd like. Perfect. And again, my apologies really not, not meant to, uh, um, uh, to arrive uh, so late. Um, first of all, I want to say, Rebecca, congratulations. This is uh, this is the kind of books that I I love because it um, uh, us in in rabbinic uh, rabbinic uh, project or or you know academic interpretation. Uh, we went through a few stages, and like in the nineteenth century, they tackled the big questions, right? And then slowly we learned the problems of that because you can make holes in big claims, and so we kind of you know, uh, descended to very minutia kind of, uh, you know, dealing with philological or specific uh, um, uh, passages. Uh, and I think in the past, I would say decade or so, we're seeing a comeback to the, 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 bigger, the, the bigger questions. And your book is definitely there, tackling, if not the biggest question of all, right, the, the attitude towards scripture and Mikra and how to do this. And you go from, uh, you know, like a, a painter from uh, biblical time to, to Tanaitic time to, you know, uh, rabbinic and moving from Palestine to Babylonia and really trying to kind of uh, uh, pull this matrix into a coherent uh, argument and coherent question. And I really salute you for this bravery because I think... Um, um, I think it's easy to 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 poke hole in big um, uh, claims or big arguments, uh, and uh, but all of us in all our life live with big theories and big claims, and and uh, because it's needed, generalization are needed, and 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 kind of like saying at the end of the day, even if one you know source says something else, and if something says at the end of the day, what did they think about scripture, you know? Um, good or bad, uh, and and you're kind of uh, uh, taking that with you know fully and engaging with the question uh, uh, coherently, and I and I salute the bravery of of doing so. I also want to say that I enjoyed reading it. This is this was this is very uh, enjoyable reading. Uh, you write beautifully, and it's uh, uh, interesting and, and engaging. Um, the flight home was uh, from a trip in Italy with my family, so I was doing this while you know watching uh, the scenery in Rome and some of the you know the sources was you know uh, doing the Roman you know Greco Roman period kind of like melange together and and your 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 voice your narrative was really uh, beautifully echoed so that needs to be uh, said and and not often said so so um, some of our books uh, in our field are horribly boring and and not appealing so yours is not. So thank you for that. Uh, and um, that needs to be said as well. Uh, uh, so um, uh, thank you. Uh, what I want to do with my time is uh, say two major things uh, and, and maybe three. But uh, uh, the first will be to try to, I, I kind of like, I want to zoom in on the question of the two tablets. So, so your book is basically um, divided into two. Uh, uh, right, the first half uh, trying to claim that uh, um, um, scripture is uh, dangerous or, or viewed as, a, as, as something to be dealt with, uh, as opposed to the myth of, of, of um, you know, uh, uh, um, scripture as the, the voice of God, period. So something much more complex and, and dangerous. And the second half tried to say, so what, so what do we do with scripture? So what's, what's what the rabbis did with it? So I want to actually hone in on the first uh, one and kind of offer um, some, some angle of my own and expand the two tablet thing uh, 
Um, so my own field of study is Jewish Christian relation and I actually engage with Rebecca's work. We actually don't know each other, uh, but I've, I've quoted Rebecca in previous work uh, um, uh, because uh, Rebecca has a tendency sometimes to quote uh, Christian sources exactly the, the way I like it. So we're kind of like uh, 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 colleagues in that sense. Uh, and I think you did this too here when you talked about the two tablets. Uh, can I share something? Is that is that possible to do? Yeah. Yes, okay. please. Uh, um, so, uh, so Rebecca actually tries to to do uh, some uh, Jewish Christian um, parallels when she's talking about the two tablets, and she she brings uh, um, uh, one source to, to, more centrally and, and and second source, and she's very careful to say I don't think it's you know directly a response to the Christian. I would push much further on that one and say yes, the two tablets and the engagement with the question of. The, the breaking of the two tablets and the way the narrative is presented in rabbinic literature has in the background, the Christian dealing with the, the breaking of the two tablets. You're very careful when you're dealing with that, which I appreciate. And when I read my um, my first works, uh, I, I sometimes cringe how much I apologize not to say, you know, direct connection because we know how dangerous it is, but I'm done cringing. So I'm like, I'm, I think you should have made that case even stronger. And I want to actually bring in another source to, to claim that it, there is there is something about specifically about that, you know, physical, uh, tangible breaking of tablets of the words of God uh, that is definitely uh, has to be read in light of Christian uh, reading and I just want to bring one more uh, source to this um, and uh, this is actually from Barnabas um, uh, da, 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 da. can you see my 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 screen it's loading there it is can you see it now there was like a yes. weird blackness in my screen that I couldn't see okay so um uh really the I am not excelling today with uh, my, my skin. Okay, so uh, Barnabas has a very, very interesting, and here I'm, I'm kind of like uh, using uh, Tobias Nicholas' uh, work on, on, on this specific, oh, Laura, say hi to him when you see him. Uh, so uh, Tobias Nicholas' work from Regensburg on this specific text. Um, uh, uh, Barnabas does a very interesting, and I don't, I, I don't know if we have time to actually read it, but he does a very interesting move with the tablet. He actually uh, um, uh, says that, uh, uh, um, uh, he, he uses that, uh, uh, he says, uh, look at that. Uh, uh, um, ours it is, right there, he's talking about the covenant. I'm, I'm reading, uh, sorry, here. Ours it is, right? But they lost it in this way forever. When Moses had just received it. Right. So he he's talking about the covenant. Right. So this is the biggest question in the first few uh, hundred years. What do we do with the fact that we have in Israel that's still around and we have to deal with uh, whose covenant it is and whose Bible it is and whose scripture it is. And he does the by 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 far the most, you know, outlandish claim by saying they had the covenant for exactly the amount in which the time it takes from God to write it and for Moses to hold it and break it. That's the only time in which Israel had the covenant. That's it. Uh, this is the, the other, right? I saw, uh, uh, let's read some of it, even though. But they lost it by turning unto idols. For thus saith the Lord, Moses come down quickly for the people, and Moses understood, and threw the two tablets in their hand, and their covenant was broken in pieces, pieces, so that the covenant of the beloved Jesus might be sealed unto their house in the hope that the spring is faith from him. So, but I, 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 I accept uh, Tobias in this, uh, that this is really the farthest any early writer of the Christian faith actually takes it by saying the Jews had it for that short amount of time, then that's it. That's the only time they had the covenant, which is exactly the words of God, the physical words of God represent. And I think, uh, Rebecca, this works very well with your argument that the words of God are represented in the written word and it's a, it's a physical object. And it was given to uh, Moses and the moment it broke, we lost, the covenant is directly linked to that and it broke so it can't be held anymore by the written so whatever uh, uh, the christian now have is the covenant of jesus and it's sealed in their heart and they're going a different you know road, road with this covenant at uh, this you know 
it, it it's it it moved right i don't know it was like in the air or something i don't know if it, until you know jesus arrived or something i don't know what the the narrative how do you live on by the way this view was not prevalent right it's not it's not all over the place it's very rare it's he, he takes it and also it's interesting that barnabas is doing it uh it's one of the the only you know, text we know that was actually we, we can date it because he's writing something about the uh the Bar Kochva revolt so we know it was written between 70 it was after the destruction of the temple, but before the Bar Kochva revolt. So it's a very short time limit. So we know they still have hope that the temple will rebuild. And he's writing it then because he wants to say, even if they rebuild the temple, even if this happens, they they never had it after the tablets broke. So I think, Rebecca, that this actually strengthens your point about uh, um, the covenant and the and the, uh, the and the discussion in rabbinic literature, even if they didn't, obviously we don't have to go, they knew that claim and they're reacting to it. No, but there's something about the covenant, I think, that is very attractive uh, with, it, with its connection to the actual tablet. So I think that that would um, help the argument in that case. Uh, that's point number one. Point number two that I want to make, this has to do with... Um, 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 uh, your whole chapter, this is, I'm going to just remember which chapter, the, ch chapter two, that had to do with um, uh, the minim and heretics and the dangerous, uh, what happens when the, the Bible gets into the hands of the wrong people, like what, what happened to it. Uh, and I think here, uh, I, I would actually, um, uh, I actually think that um, uh, the, 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 the layers uh, you you do a beautiful job every time to you know make a make a point of the difference between Tanaitic and and Yerushalmi and Bavli, but I would still say that they think there is a there is a point to be made about a more subtle difference when we come to heretics. So this is something uh, my second book deals with heretic stories in the Talmud, and I think there is a big I think the 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 the, the reference to um, uh, Shlomo's book who deals only with Tanaitic literature and define heresy as. Um, sectarianism or kind of shies away from uh, because he's he is dealing with earlier sources that there might be a point to it in later sources it doesn't apply and I think there we can do we can be much more on solid ground when we're talking about heresy as heresy and in this case it I think it brings some questions to the to to why then scripture is dangerous in those hands now so so I think it, it makes the question a little bit more complex and deserve more um, so, for example, I wrote in a few places that the fact that you're only using translations, I have the same problem I, I published with Cambridge and they don't like Hebrew and, you know, so we, we, we they make us use only translation, which I think, by the way, is awesome because it makes us Hebrew speaker commit to a translation. We, I love translation. I think they're really good. But sometimes I think we also need the original Hebrew. Uh, in that case, uh, when you're translating, I don't know, I, I just wrote down a few sources when you're translating, let's say, um, there was some, uh, uh, da, 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 this is like from the Tosefta, when you're doing, um, uh, you're translating idolaters and, and heretics, and it, we only have the English. And the Hebrew itself, the terms itself, I think deserve a little bit more attention, especially in the different layers between early and later, because what does it mean? What does the mean mean, right? And I dedicate a lot of time to that in my book. And I think uh, the Bavli is well rooted, at least in some sources in the Christian world. And that deserve in itself a different, I think this is, cannot be um, the philological discussion of manuscript and, and, and terms and their reception, I think, deserve a little bit more attention. I think, actually, it, it, it can help your point and just makes it a little bit richer in terms of the different sources. And this is about heretics. And lastly, and this is my last one in here, I'll, 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 I'll finish. Um, I disagree with your decision to not quote and not put your book uh, within a larger uh, scholarly discussion. Uh, I see your point as being a woman in a field that's uh, probably predominant by men and, and, and knowing the problem of um, quotation, right? Who we quote and how we quote the dominance of it. And we say in Hebrew, chaver mevi chaver, a friend brings a friend, right? You only, you know, you quote your friends and he brings us a certain, I, I see the problem. I don't think the solution is to use so little quotes. I often felt that your discussion would have been much richer if it would have been put in uh, within the larger scheme of scholarship. 
there are sources and there are people who discussed it and there, you know, there's way to incorporate it by fighting, you know, biases and, and doing this as part of it. I don't think that's the way to go. I think the way to fight sexism, to just quote a lot of women and give them the, the right place and put them in the center of the book, but do like engage. I also think that I kind of read this book and I was like, I loved it. It was like, well, you know, the in the beginning, you, you understand the problem very well. And it's this. But I, I often felt that someone who doesn't have my background and doesn't know what, you know, the, the literature said about it wouldn't. They would just read your book and not know that this is part of a very, this is like the richest subject ever. Everyone wrote about it and he wouldn't know or she wouldn't know the, the background of it. And I think that needs reconsideration, if I might say so. I think that's that's something that is not, I think, ideal. Uh, for this, especially especially in a in a really in, in a book that, that claims to be, to do something very very big. Now I under, I I know it's cumbersome, and I come from you know I I, I uh, you read Zussman article and there's like one line and there's like gazillion footnotes and and stuff. So, so there's a middle road. Uh, but I think I think um, here I I think this is not uh, ideal. Uh, way to deal with the problem of the field, and I would uh, I highly recommend uh, dealing more with the uh, with the scholarship. But thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about this, and I apologize again for for not being um, on time and 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 screwing this up. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Michal. Um, there's a lot to digest there. Uh, what I propose uh, right now with the time that remains, uh, Rebecca, if you want to respond to Michal's comments first because they're fresh in your mind, feel free to do so. Um, or to begin with, uh, Daniel had some you know, comments, I think, that were apropos. Uh, I think of his comment on the hyper-open text, this uh, uh, term he's tossed out there. And after that, we can also allow Laura to ask uh, a question and see what time remains for further discussion. Amazing. So I will go backwards because it's fresh in my mind. And I've also been rethinking the bibliographic choices. I feel like in some ways you told me I was wrong, but you confirmed what I was hoping for. But also I've been rethinking in the background myself for a reason. Um, so on the one hand, I didn't feel like as it like I'm coming in, this is my dissertation book. And I wasn't sure that going in, guns blazing, saying, I think what this one really meant was this, and I don't agree. It just it just felt like chutzpah and distracting a little bit from the conversation. Like it would, I, I wanted this to be a conversation starter, which is where I felt like what you just showed us really worked. It's like, I think this thing might be Christians. You know what? I'm not going to go to the mat for it. I'm not sure. And you were like, no, actually it is. <laughs> Let me show you how, right? So like that starts a conversation where folks who know it better can then, you know, can then engage with it and do whatever they want saying like oh maybe this is an idea actually it's bigger than you realize that was what i wanted and i thought that maybe by pulling back in the bibliographic sources and by not jumping into like an argument it would be less about who's right and more about just a proposal and people can do with it what they will so in that sense i think that worked but at the same time i think we heard a lot today that people are actually using this maybe as a teaching text that's probably going to be its thing right because it coalesces things that a lot of us already kind of thought maybe in certain places, but it just writes it out, which is great. But I went to, uh, I had a talk at Duke, I don't know, maybe six months ago, and I got borderline yelled at, which for Duke is like really <laughs> quite interesting because someone said, this is a terrible influence on graduate students. Like I can't, as you said, for those of us who know, we're coming in the middle of a conversation. I just say like, drop my piece, here's what I'm gonna say. And we're able to fill in in the back of our minds all the like, well, Shalom Ma'es, that actually it was the Aramaic Revolution, so we're thinking of that. But the students don't have that. And so it, it sort of restarts the conversation for them in a way I hadn't really thought through, right? Because I was so immersed in it, you're so immersed in it, I figured we all knew it. And then I realized, actually, you re really write books for graduate students, they don't know it. So what, you start the conversation fresh? I hadn't thought that through. And this is not the first time someone's told me about it, you were much nicer. The other... <laughs> the other critique was very like, he would clearly tried to use it and it was frustrating. So that's the first thing. But then I wanted to return for a second to Daniel's point. I honestly, I think you convinced me that what you're saying is true. And I was not attentive enough um, to the way that the consonantal text um, was exciting and productive for them in proportion to how dangerous it was. I'll tell you, here's what I was thinking. Originally, when I was writing this, I thought, 
look, you see in the Bavli, for example, they get very into, well, what is actually definitive, mikra or masoret, right? Like the consonantal transcript or the spoken version. And, you know, the answer is always in these arguments, every single time, it's mikra. The spoken version is the one that defines what this Torah means when push comes to shove. If you're making a halakha, if you really need to know the answer, that's the one. But now that you're talking, I realize that those conversations go on for like an hour, right? Because even though they're going to come out in favor of Mikra, they want to talk about all the different things you can do with the Masoret, with the, the written consonantal transcript, how how many different ways you can read it. And they really dig into that and show you those things. And only at the very end do they say, okay, but we don't, you know, this can't be the dominant version for us. So I just felt like, oh, maybe they liked playing with it, right? Like it's fun, it's creative, great. But now you're talking, I'm realizing there's this Yerushalmi and Megillah in chapter four, and it says actually the Torah was revealed in four parts, right? Mikra, Targum, Zamim, Masoret. Like it has like the sort of me melody and the punctuation, the translation, like a fixed meaning. As Michal was saying, when you translate, you choose like what this means, right? Mikra, this third, what I'm calling the third Torah, the spoken version, and the consonantal transcripts. And I don't think I was attentive enough to what it would mean if all four of those were equal. Like what it would mean if the Masoret was both dangerous and a really important and productive and intended part of what it meant to have written Torah. What does that open, hyper open text do for us or do for them? It's such an interesting question. Um, and I mean, basically I just agree with you. And I think Megillah already agreed with you on that. And I had not been attentive enough reading it. I was bringing my own, um, as Margie was saying earlier, like we bring our own prejudices to these things. And sometimes we just, I think, misread based on them. So that's really interesting. Thank you. Hey, uh, um, thank you for that. Laura, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, um, I just, I was thinking, I well, well, well I have you. <laughs> Cause I mentioned, you know, my picture and again, cause I, I I mean, I have to speculate about the Paitanim because we don't have any information about them. Um, but the picture that emerges from them is of these people who really sort of had the Torah in them is sort of how I picture them. You know, they're sort of just like, you know, I think about the way like you, we all have that friend who can quote the Seinfeld or, you know, know the Simpsons, you know, everyone who they, some people just like have internalized the thing they love. And so the Paitanim loved the Torah in this way that says that it just, flowed from them in these creative, recombinative ways. But the text that I've often sort of thought of in relationship to the Paitanim is one from Shirashim Raba. And I don't think it's one that's in your book. And it's one, it's uh it's a it's in the passage where um um let's see, I looked it up. It's a it's in the passage in Shirshim Rabbah on Lareach Shemanecha Tovim. And it's where Rabbi Akiva has come to the Beit HaMidrash late. And so he's sitting outside and in the passage, a question arose and is such and such the halakha. And they said, the halakha is outside. Again, a question arose and they said, the Torah is outside. Again, a question arose and they said, Akiva is outside, make way for him. He came and sat at the feet of Rabbi Eliezer. The Beit HaMidrash of Rabbi Eliezer was shaped like an arena, which of course that's important for me for my performance work. And there was in it a stone which was reserved for him to sit on. Once Rabbi Joshua came in and began kissing the stone and saying, this stone is like Mount Sinai and he who sat on it is like the Ark of the Covenant. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts because to me, I mean, well, number one to me, this is sort of like, oh, Logos. Uh, for Enoch seminar people, I don't know, um, totally out of my depth on that comment, but just, but it's the idea that Akiva is somehow like Torah incarnate, you know, that he, you don't need to, to look at a written text, you have Akiva, he is Halakha, he is Torah, and that he's the Ark of the Covenant, where he sits is Sinai, I mean, I don't know, that seems like it could be fun for you to play with. That is such an amazing source. I cannot believe I missed that. That's amazing. Um, I also, you know, Rudolf Ware wrote this book, The Walking Quran, about how folks who've memorized the entire Quran are considered like really quite literally an embodiment. And 
I think I mentioned it in passing. It's like, oh, that's cool, right? Like, what a cool parallel. But it's hard not to think of it metaphorically. What if the rabbis, like the folks who think that way, really understood, right? In the same way the Torah could be a body, a body can be a Torah. That would be so interesting. Oh, I wish I'd thought of that. This is beautiful. Very nice. Thanks. I'm going to take the opportunity. I have a couple of questions, if I may ask, like uh, prompted by the discussion, etc. When I was telling people about the, this event, and you know, many of my colleagues are not specialists in rabbinics at all, it was challenging to explain to them what your book was about. You know, it's like, well, it's about how the rabbis of late antiquity related to the Bible, and uh, the, the claim is that they 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 kind of didn't really care so much about. Uh, uh, closely reading the the text, uh, the text wasn't uh, so authoritative as one might uh, imagine, etc. And and I can imagine this is a superficial reaction, of course. Um, how how can one say that? Do, we have uh, midrashim, we have midrashim halacha. We, we you know we have Tanaitic midrashim that uh, comment on the the written text. We have the midrashim agada. We have the midrash rabbah and on migilot, etc. So I, I'd like to maybe hear uh, a response to that kind of, you know, uh, knee-jerk reaction one might have uh, to the thesis of your book without actually engaging with what is a very insightful, nuanced, uh, learned book, um, just to, you know, maybe spice things up here. And, and the second question is, perhaps for all of the panelists, I want to take the opportunity to benefit from your wisdom and your expertise uh, with re with regard to uh, what extent the the rabbis of the Talmudic period, the classical period, are aware of um, the wider uh, context of the verses of scripture that they're quoting. Because I mean, they're left and right. There are quotations in the Gemara, elsewhere, of biblical verses. T to what extent they know what is going on around the text and, and even care about that? Because that's often an argument or an assertion that's made. Um, and, and Rebecca, I find your work very consequential, not just to rabbinic studies, but also for the Second Temple period. Admittedly, a, an earlier period, but... Paul's on my mind right now since there's two papers I have to write that are that are due very soon. And I'm just thinking how how much of this might relate to Paul, for example, or, or a second temple Jewish author that also seems to disregard sometimes details of the scripture. You know, in Galatians chapter three, he's saying you could almost translate this into Hebrew and insert it into the, the Gemara. I mean, the text doesn't say uh, seeds. It says seed, you know, and from that he makes a great amount of it. And so therefore, uh, Abraham's seed, Zerahraham, is, is Messiah, uh, Jesus, meaning that what? Does that Jews aren't seed of Abraham? Haven't you read the context of Genesis and every seed? Seed means seed. It's, uh, it's the descendants of Abraham that are seed of Abraham. And, and it's very common in, in Pauline scholarship to say that Paul knows about the wider scriptural universe, that is surrounding these texts that he seems to be taking almost in an ad hoc way, disregarding the details of the text. So I'd be very curious to just hear from any of the panelists, uh, including the author, what they have to say about that when the rabbis are, are quoting scripture, to what extent they're attentive to the wider context from where these verses are, are pulled out. But what about you know these midrashim Midrashic works from late antiquity that are dedicated to commenting on scripture. Could I just answer that question and leave the yes, other one please. for the real rabbinicists in the room? Okay. I, I've gotten some really rich reviews. I'm very grateful. My favorite review to date, though, is one I got from the Gospel Coalition, which was, you know, shocking. Um, and it was so funny because this, you know, person read the book and said, oh, now the rabbis have basically fallen also. We're the only ones who actually read scripture. Now it turns out this is just human nature. Everyone says they're quoting scripture, says they're working with scripture, but really they're not. They're working with something in their own heads and they're bringing it to the table and they're not be attentive, you know, to God's written word. And he went on at some length and there was some anti-Catholic stuff there that was, um, but, you know, this was the final human nature, and he gave a lot of examples from real life. And actually, 
um, he didn't bring this example, but my favorite example is a colleague of mine did an ethnographic study of Wednesday night Bible circles here in Ann Arbor. And he talked about one thing, which I think is great. And it kind of relates to Paul. There's this transitive property, he's, he claims, of the way people deal with scripture. They think they're talking about scripture. They have their hand on a book. The book is often closed. And they're saying, as Paul said in Galatians, and then they proceed to say whatever they want, right? They're not being disingenuous. They think they're talking about Galatians, but who knows? I don't mean you. I mean, obviously, as scholars, we have a slightly more attentive um, way of dealing with text. But there's this transitive property where your voice then is ascribed to scripture. So I think that actually, I think the person from the Gospel Coalition is right. You can say you're very, very attentive to scripture, and it can be so central in your life. And also, you cannot be reading that book, and you can be saying something only slightly adjacent and that is apparently just human nature and it's so interesting um we live in a very specific cultural context with a very specific reading practice in the universities that's often very protestant and that's just one tiny way of relating to this text there's many many other ways of being very um scripture interested without actually reading that much if that makes sense and I did see that uh, review by the Gospel Coalition. It's one of the first things that uh, one comes across when you search it, search your book, which is interesting, right? The works that we write, uh, the attention that it, it, it garners might come from circles that uh, one doesn't uh, initially uh, expect uh, to, to happen. But uh, Daniel, you, you have your hand raised, so um, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, follow on what Rebecca said in relation to your question about question whether the rabbis are attentive to the context. And I wonder if, especially the way things that Rebecca points out about the focus on the memorized Bible, the memorized mm -hmm. scriptural text, uh, and how that could itself uh, generate a different attitude to context as compared to visually looking at a, a written page. Because if you have a written page of text or a scroll even, uh, you know you can see visually this verse is next to this verse. There's a visual context. And other ones would be further away, you know, distance-wise. Just they're a later part of the scroll, later part of the text, and there might be a way in which distance and proximity function differently. And just in the way uh, the mind works, if something is memorized, uh, the way, uh, for instance, if uh, you think of one verse, uh, then you might call to mind a verse that happens to be somewhere else, further away in the Torah. But if you have them both memorized, the fact that they have a similar word in both of them might make them closer together in the in the memory distance. Uh, and so the the what we normally think of as reading something in context might be more tied to a written visual a visual context on that same page. This verse is on the same page as that verse. Whereas with a, a memorized text, the notion of something being uh, nearby something else could be nearby in a, a memory associative way that is even if it's not on the same uh, visual page. So I just that that the memorized Bible aspect that Rebecca highlights could I think illuminate some of the the rabbinic practices at least partially with that regard. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, yes, Michal. I I, I want to say that I think um, uh, having an idea in mind and reading a text, uh, you know, we 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 all know we all do it to some extent, right? We we've we've learned that, so um, that doesn't scare me or you know makes me uh, you know. Depends on how far you go. The problem with the rabbis, which I think you kind of highlight, but uh, and other scholars have, have spoken a lot about, is that uh, the rabbis some, sometimes come up with this weird ways of reading that you're saying, oh, they're completely off. What, what are they going on about? You know, this is so far from uh, what the simple meaning of the text or you know um, uh, says, uh, and and we need to acknowledge that. Right. So that that needs to be acknowledged alongside the fact that a lot of the times they're actually going off. And this is where philology, old, boring manuscript, grammar oriented philology is paramount and, and crucial to understanding every text uh, is sometimes we don't give them enough because they go on tangents and because they have everything. We don't give them enough credit for the fact that sometimes they know the grammar, they know when something doesn't work, they know they need some solve, they know they 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 hear the, um, oh, I don't know say that in English, the uh, that the, the text doesn't um, doesn't align it, it kind of like, uh, 
a squeaky noise. I don't know how to say that in English. That the voice, the, the the text is not and is not smooth, and 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 they notice this more than us because they're closer to it in time. They're closer to it in register of the language, and 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 we have to pay much more. You remember how I said the pendulum switched from like you know we're back to the big question. We shouldn't forget that aspect as well, the minutia of the details, because sometimes they do read the text. Maybe we don't like their answers, or maybe their answer looks weird to us. But sometimes they start off with a very real. Um, um, uh, basic grammatical or basic understanding of the uh, of the of the Hebrew text, which 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 we should give give credit to as well. So it's not enough to just say yes, they have things in mind and they are logical when they're reading it, and they're you know they feel the text is dangerous and they have to represent the word of God and they have their own ideology. Blah blah. blah. This is clear and and true, and everyone was doing it, and we're all doing it, right? That this is what we. But uh, we should not neglect that other. Part that needs to be the work that needs the legwork that needs to be done for that. And when we're presenting what their relationship to scripture is overall, we have to take both sides into account and, and take that into consideration. Thanks for they sharing were good that. Reader. They were good readers of the text. They were good readers oh. of the text. Sometimes they chose to go somewhere else, but they were good readers of the text. Sorry. And Srimot, according to Morphix, is grating sound, incomp incompatibility or contradiction. Uh, Marjorie, you had your hand raised. Um, yes, quickly. I see we're just about out, out of time. Um, but I just wanted to say that um, whenever I'm doing work with a pasuk, with a verse, and I'm teaching or I'm doing it for my own, I'm always looking at the context. I never not look at the context and so that's part of our training as using a written bible in order to you know study what it is we're studying and so um and sometimes it really works like sometimes there really is something contextual that is driving that we can't really ignore and i respect the comments about orality and that being important but the fact is is that very you know sometimes they were quite aware of what was, and I think this is just picking up on what Michal was saying, they're quite aware of what's right before and right after, um, and um, and they're kind of bringing that, um, you know, to their whatever analysis or interpretation. And so I just, I think that the context really is something that matters a lot, and, and anyway, that we should ignore it. So anyway. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're pretty much uh, almost at the end of our segment. I'd like to provide, before we end, an opportunity for uh, Rebecca, if you want to share any final words or comments, uh, the opportunity is available for you to do so. I mean, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who came to talk about this, which is like, I just, especially on a Monday morning, especially coming from a plane, everything, it was really, really generous. And I so, so much appreciate it. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank Canvas you, everybody. Author for joining us. Um, I want to maybe just uh, share a few comments here before we leave. Uh, Joshua here is reminding us that our next uh, Meet the Author uh, event, author series event, is on December the 18th with James McGrath from 1030 to 1230 p.m. Um, I also want to just acknowledge this morning, I learned as this event was happening, that Paolo Saki has passed away. Paolo Saki was the professor of Gabriele Boccaccini, founder of the Enoch Seminar. Um, so uh, I just acknowledge that, want to remember him at this moment. Uh, we will later have this uploaded on the YouTube channel of the Enoch Seminar and Tom Wood for Everyone. Um, thank you to Joshua Scott, as always, for helping us uh, host these events. Uh, without you, it would not be uh, possible. And I wish, in the meantime, everyone a rest of a good day or evening to you. Voila.